Okay. So, uh, welcome back. So, last time we talked about the intermediate value property of continuous functions. So, uh, I am just shortening it, uh, shortening it to IVP. So, here is the intermediate value property itself. You are, if you are given a continuous function and you have an interval i and given any y value, so here is a b and if you are given a function which goes between the boundary values f of a and f of b, given any y value between the two, there is an x value at which that y value is attained. That is basically what the intermediate value property says. So, let us look at some very interesting applications of the intermediate value property. So, the first application is sometimes denoted or sometimes goes by the name of fixed point theorems or uh, trying to find fixed points in various situations. So, here is uh, here is the, the general setup here. Uh, for a fixed point theorem. So, here is an example of a fixed point theorem. So, let us take imagine the interval between 0 and 1 and let us for the moment pretend that this is some sort of a rubber rubber band. So, in this in a sense that uh, in the sense that it can now be stretched. So, I have the interval between 0 and 1 and what we will now do is the following. We will imagine stretching this this rubber band such that the end point 0 moves to something to the left of it. So, you know we, we sort of take it and stretch it. So, let us say 0 moves to some point to the left of 0. Let us give it a name. So, let us say 0 moves to a point L, the left end point and 1, the right end point moves to some real number r. So, let us say L and r now denote the new so, this L and R now denote the new positions of the endpoints. So, that is what the rubber band now looks like. Okay. So, the orange denotes what it looked like initially and after the stretch you have got the, the yellow rubber band. Now, of course, the stretch itself is assumed to be a continuous process. right? So, you are just sort of stretching it the whole way and now here is the, here's the interesting statement it says there exists a point on the, the original rubber band which does not move during this stretch. Okay? So, there is a so called fixed point, a point which does not suffer any displacement during this transformation. So, let us write it out, there exists, so here is the statement we'll, which we will try and prove, there exists a point, <coughs> let us call it x naught on the original rubber band which means x naught was a point between 0 and 1 which does not move from its place during this stretch which So, here is one way of stating it. Here is uh, there exists a point on the rubber band which does not move during the stretching process. Okay. So, let us try and prove this using the intermediate value theorem. So, this depending on how you think of it, it might uh, sound somewhat counterintuitive that you know and also the key thing here is no matter how this stretching is done. Okay. So, I do not assume anything about L and R you can imagine stretching this to to any length for instance right? l and r can be l could be arbitrarily small r could be arbitrarily large and no matter how the stretch is performed how long the final rubber band is and so on uh, this statement is independent of all that no matter what you do there exists a point which will never move during the stretching process okay so let's try and prove this it's a nice application that gives us an idea of what the intermediate value theorem really does so, of course, in order to connect this up with the intermediate value theorem, you need a function. So, let us do the following. Let us define a function f from the interval 0, 1 to the real numbers. Okay. And what is my what is my definition? So, 0, 1 remember is like your rubber band. 
So, I will define the function as follows, as follows. For each point x on the rubber band, let f of x denote the displacement of x. So, what is displacement? of the point x, which by definition means the new position of x minus the old position, the new position of x minus the old position. Okay. So, my function f is just the displacement function and let us just figure out what this does to the two endpoints. So, the left end point 0 is now displaced by what? Well, the new position is L, the old position of course was a 0. So, this is L. The right end point 1 is now displaced to the, well, is now at the point R. It was originally at 1. So, this is R minus 1. Okay. So, here are the, the two values of displacement. The left end point is displaced by L, the right end point is displaced by R minus 1 and observe that L is a negative number because L of course is to the left of 0. R minus 1, since R is to the right of 1, R minus 1 is a strictly positive number. I do not care what they are, all I need to know is that L is negative and R minus 1 is positive. Okay. So, let us imagine drawing the graph of this function f. So, now I have 0 to 1. So, here comes the important thing. Uh, the function f here is not really defined on all real numbers, but only on the interval 0, 1, but the intermediate value property continues to hold. I just while I stated it, I sort of said between a function from r to r, but it is enough for it to be a function from the interval 0, you know, a, b to r. So, let us just see what the graph should look like. Uh, at 0, so I am going to draw the graph of the function f. So, at 0, it is the value l is negative. At 1, it takes the value r minus 1, whatever that be, which is some positive value. So, here are the two endpoints from L to r minus 1 and what I know is that there is some graph, right? I do not quite know what the graph looks like also because a graph would just tell me what the displacement is of individual points on the rubber band and the actual shape of the graph will depend on how the stretching was done. You know, I might have stretched uh, the left half of the rubber band a little more than the right half and so on and so forth. So, depending on what exactly was done to the rubber band, the shape of this graph would change. I could, you know, instead of sort of going up like this, it might have gone uh, a lot more up initially and down later and so on. So, but again, I do not really care. As I said, it is independent of how the stretch was performed. The key property now is the following. The only thing we need is that the stretch is continuous. So, we are going to assume and it is a reasonable assumption to make that f is continuous. It just says that you deform it in a continuous fashion. Now, the fact that at 0 it took a negative value and at 1 it took a uh, positive value means that by the intermediate value property, there exists some intervening point at which it takes the value 0. Right? This graph must cut the x axis, that is basically all it means. So, there exists a point x naught at which so, then since f is continuous by the intermediate value property, there exists a value of x naught between 0 and 1 satisfying such that the value of f at x naught is 0. So, 0 is the value c that we are now choosing. It is the value between the two endpoints. Okay. So, there is, there is a point at which f takes the value 0. So, what does that mean? That of course, means that the displacement of x naught is 0. So, this means that, so what is f of x naught 0 means that it suffers 0 displacement. In other words, its new position is the same as its old position. New position of x naught is the same as the old position. In other words, x naught does not move and that is exactly what we wanted to prove. So, i e x naught does not move. Okay. So, this is often called a fixed point theorem which says that there is a point which is fixed under some transformation. So, here is the first example. It turns out 
to just be an application of the, the intermediate value property. Now, here is uh, example 2 and this is sometimes what is called the process of finding roots. So, root finding now of course, it is a, a special case of root finding. So, what does a root mean? So, suppose I have a function f a root of course, is a value of x at which it takes the uh, at which the function takes the value 0, it is a point at which it cuts the x axis. So, here for instance is a root of this function and so, the way I drew it here there are 3 roots 3 places where it cuts the x axis and often given given a function uh, somewhat complicated function for instance, it may not actually be possible to explicitly solve for the roots, right. Solving for roots for instance is easy if you are doing uh, quadratic equations and so on, but more generally finding a root exactly may not really be feasible. So, what one wants at least is some sort of approximate root, okay. we want some sorts of approximations to, to the roots okay. and here is an algorithm for finding roots which uh, more or less uses the intermediate value property. So, here is the uh, here are the assumptions, suppose I am given a function f a continuous function f. So, let us see what our assumptions are uh, given f let us say it is not even defined on all of real numbers suppose I just knew that it was defined on an interval f from a b to r f continuous and with an additional property such that at the end points f of a and f of b are of opposite sign. So, such that f of a and f of b are of opposite signs. In other words, let us say it is positive on the left end point and negative at the right end point. So, I, I can always assume say let us just make the following assumption. Let us say that f of a is positive, f of b is negative. Okay. If this is the case, then observe firstly by the intermediate value property, we know that there must be a value of x between a and b at which the function takes a value 0 okay. and observe this is more or less like what we encountered in our first example. Note by intermediate value property, there must be a root of f between a and b, there must be a root of the function f in the interval a b. Okay. Now, the question is how do we find this root to some given degree of accuracy. Okay. So, we just want to figure out a way of determining this root. So, here is the idea there must be a root between a and b and what we assume f of a is positive and let us say f of b is negative. So, this is say uh, how the graph might look and we are trying to find that point. So, here is what we do, let us make a, a sequence of approximations, let us make a sequence of guesses. So, let us define, let us take the midpoint of the original interval. So, here is an algorithm, so sometimes called the bisection algorithm. to find the root. So, what it says is the following. So, let us take the original interval, let us call the original interval as i 0 because we will now construct a sequence of new new intervals. So, let i 0 denote the original interval. Now, let us do the following, let us take the midpoint of i 0. So, let us call it m 0 be the midpoint of i 0. Okay, what does that mean? m 0 therefore, is just a plus b by 2 just the average of the endpoints. So, you have the original uh, interval and you take the midpoint, let us say this is what the midpoint is m 0. Now, you compute the value of the function at the midpoint, okay. the function value in this example at the midpoint is positive. Okay. So, we compute, so here is uh, let us call it step 0 if you wish of the algorithm.
Now, what do we do? We compute the value of f at the midpoint. So, the, the function f itself is presumably given in some nice way, there is some formula. So, we compute f of m0. Now, what are the possibilities? f of m0 could be either positive, negative, or 0. So, f of m0 uh, could be positive, it could be 0, or it could be negative. So, there are three possibilities in general. So, of course, in this example that I drew, I assumed you know I drew it in such a way that the midpoint value was positive. Now, what do we do in each of these cases? So, if f of m0 is positive, so let us look at this one here, the value of uh, f at m0 is positive. What does that mean? It means the following. Let us get rid of the function in the first half. So, now just focus attention on the portion of the function between m0 and b. Now, here again we have f of m0, the left end point value is positive, the right end point value is negative. So, it is sort of like the original function by intermediate value property, there must be a root of the function between m0 and b. Okay? So, we could conclude the same thing again. So, here is the, uh, the thing to do, if f of m0 is positive, let us do the following, you define your new interval. So, you, you get rid of half of the interval, you define the new interval, so let us call this the new interval is called i1 now to be the interval between m0 and b. Similarly, if the value of, of f at m0 is negative, then you, you take the other half of the interval. You take the interval between a and m0, where again you have the same, same feature that the value at the left end point is positive, the value at the right end point is negative. And of course, if the value of, of f at m0 is 0, you are already done, you have already found a root. Right here, in fact, you, you would have found it exactly. So, this of course means that m0 is a root. So, you would have found the root and you can just stop the algorithm right there. Okay? But of course, in practice, you will almost always end up with either the first or the, the last cases. And in those cases, you define i1 to be half of the interval. Here, you take the right half and here, you take the left half. Okay? And now, you just repeat the process. So, step 0 is basically the prototype. Now, you repeat the same thing with i1 instead, repeat same step, so repeat the above step with the interval i1 in place of i0. Okay, what does that mean? Let us just think of it once. So, I had i0 between a and b, I have i1, so maybe I will just do it in this figure right here. So, I had i0 to start with and I computed the value of f at the midpoint and took only the right half of the interval as i1, so here is my interval i1 and now I do the same thing. What does that mean? I take the midpoint of this interval, okay? so the interval i1 what is its midpoint? It is something called m1, this case. What is m1? It is m0 plus b divided by 2. So, I have some midpoint. I compute the value of the function at the midpoint and I see whether the function value is negative or positive. So, in this case, the function value turns out to be negative, the way I drew the graph. So, again, that means that I, I should do the following. I will get rid of the right half of this interval and only focus attention on the left half, the part between m0 and m1. Okay, call this i2 and now again by the intermediate value property, there must be a root between you know, the left end point m0 and the right end point m1 and so on and so forth. Now, when you keep doing this algorithm uh, for a large number of steps, what you end up with is the following, that the interval that you are left with at each step is only half the size of the preceding interval. Okay? So, observe the following facts about, so what we really have is the following, we, we keep, uh, we obtain a sequence of intervals. So, we obtain the following, a sequence of intervals So, I0, so this contains the next interval I1, which contains the next interval I2 and so on. And the length at each step becomes half. So, if the original length, so let us say here are the lengths of these intervals, 
suppose i not had length l okay which is b minus a uh, i1 has length l by 2 the next guy has length l by 4 and so on so if i take the do this for n steps i get an interval whose size is just l divided by 2 power n okay so the intervals are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and what you conclude is the following at every step so what what do you get we get an obtain a sequence of intervals with these lengths and what is the key property and such that f of x has a root in i n for every n has a root in i n for you know for all, all values of n that you have, you have obtained. So, so let us say you keep doing this so has a root in every interval just write it like that every one of these intervals okay so this is of course assuming that uh, you didn't yet find a root so observe if you evaluated f on some midpoint and you actually got the value 0 then that's already you, you are done you have found the root exactly and you don't need to keep doing this algorithm anymore so assuming you don't succeed in finding a root at any given step you can keep going on and on and on for let us say you, you keep going for 100 steps then here is what you know at the 100th step the interval that you obtain the i n or i 100 contains a root of the function f because that is exactly the property which with using which you define the, the next interval. So if say your goal was to find a root of the given function f to within an approx uh, to within an accuracy of let us say you know 0 0.001 or 0 0.00001 or whatever be the given accuracy all you must do is just keep doing this process until the interval size becomes smaller than the required accuracy okay so the general algorithm now says keep going until the size of the interval until the interval obtain becomes smaller is smaller than the required accuracy okay, whatever be the given accuracy and uh, once you you reach that step you can just take your approximate root to be any point inside the interval i n Okay, you do you I mean you could take the midpoint for instance or any point in the interval i n will still do because if the interval i n has you know length which is smaller than you know whatever be the accuracy 0 0.0001 and so on uh, there surely exists a root somewhere in this interval that much we know we do not know where the root is. So, let us say this is where the exact root is so this is the actual root but let us say we pick the midpoint as our choice of approximate root so suppose this is what we pick so this is our choice of approximate root and here is the actual root the difference between these two is at most the size of this interval right because they both lie in this interval the difference between the actual and our approximation is at most the length of this interval but since the interval is already smaller than the required accuracy we are done we do not need to to worry anymore we have obtained the root within the required accuracy okay so this algorithm is uh, is often called the bisection method and uh, it, it can be a rather powerful way of finding an approximate um, root of a function f sort of try out to get a sense of how this works so here's a problem so i'd like you to try out on your own to get a sense of how this works you define a function let us say I take the function f of x is so I am going to use the function e power x minus x squared minus 3 halves and I am going to take my interval i naught to be just the interval 0 1 and so here is the problem find the root of this function find the root of f of x inside this interval to within an accuracy of 1 over 100 to within okay 
and use the bisection method to try and do this. Okay, so I leave this as an exercise. So here's a, this was the second application of uh, the intermediate value property. Now let, let's look at a more geometrical application. So something to do with how uh, regions in the plane can be divided and so on. So here is an example which is sometimes goes by the name of cake cutting problems. So the setup is the following, you imagine you have a, a shape, a region on the plane of some arbitrary shapes. Okay? So I am not really imposing any condition except that let us say the boundary is some nice closed curve, it is a bounded region. So imagine you have this region on the plane. Okay? So this is an arbitrary shaped cake if you wish and the goal is the following, what you want to do is to cut this into two equal halves by using a line that is let us say by a vertical line, okay? a line parallel to the y axis. So here is the, here's the statement itself, it says there exists a line parallel to the y axis which cuts this cake into two equal halves. So cake cutting uh, problem says, well, here is the assertion that we will try and prove that is a line parallel to the y axis which cuts this region, let us call this region as R which cuts, uh, which divides region into two equal halves or which bisects, well okay, let me write it as which divides R into two equal regions or two regions of equal area. So let us try and prove this statement or see why it is an really an instance of the intermediate value property. So in order to use the intermediate value property, what one really needs to do is to define a function as usual. right? So let us do the following, let us define a function. So let me define a function f from let us say r to r. So what should it do? Well, so imagine we have, so what should, what should f do? Well, for each real number x in R, let us do the following, so let us again draw this, this figure. So I have this whatever funny shaped figure here. Now for each choice of x, I will do the following, I will draw a vertical line through passing through the point x, comma 0. So let us say this is your value of x, now what you do is you do the following, you draw the vertical line here. So let us call this vertical line as L, L through x, through x, comma 0, let us call it Lx. So imagine you draw a line like that and you define the function as follows, that line will presumably divide this uh, given region R in some arbitrary proportion. Right? For instance, the line could be even all the way to the left of this region, in which case uh, you know, it really does not do any division at all. But let us do the following, let us say f of x is the following, it is the area to the left of this line that is that area minus the area to the right of this line. Okay. So let us keep track of uh, what proportion it divides the given region R into or the difference in the two pieces. So f of x is just the area, uh, area of R of the region R that lies to the left of this line. minus the area that rise to the light of this line. So area of the region R to the right of this line Lx. So having defined the function, what we now need to do is to just check that, so first we observe this function is continuous because as you 
uh, move the value of x as you change the value of x the line of course moves. So, observe firstly, so here is a key point to keep in mind this function f that we have defined is in fact continuous. Why is that? Because what happens as you change the value of x? So, I have some value of x. So, here is the line L x and let us say I change x slightly. So, I have another line. So, let us call this line here L x and the line to the right of x. So, let us call this uh, let us call this value as x and let us call this maybe as uh, z. So, I have a line L z x and z are, are very near each other. Now, what happens is the, the area that is to the left of x minus the area to the right of x that is the function we are defining and similarly the area to the left of z minus the area to the right of z. Now, observe that the area that is really sandwiched in between these two lines that is really the, the difference that you are going to get between uh, the function f of x and uh, the function value at x and z and this area is really going to become very, very small as you let these two lines come very close to each other. Okay? So, uh, so anyway, I am just sort of giving you some kind of heuristic for why this function is continuous, but what we really want to do now is to figure out what the intermediate value property says. So, imagine uh, if x is some number to the left of this region, so let us do the following, take L so, let L and R be the following, L is a value of x or maybe I will just call it A and B. So, let A be some x value that is much to the left of this region R and let B denote an x value which is much to the right of this region R. Okay. So, let A be, be any numbers as in figure as in the figure and we will just focus on the interval between a and b that is all we really need to worry about. So, let us look at the function f as defined before, but only on the interval a b. So, observe that if I take the value of f at a, what it will give me is the area to the left of a minus the area to the right of a there is no area to the left of A, the entire area lies to the right of A. So, this is just going to give me 0 which is to the area to the left minus the area to the right which is the full area of the region R. Okay. So, that is for A. Now, for the right end point B, here the, the area to the left is the full area and the area to the right is a 0. Okay. So, f of A and f of B are in fact of opposite signs. One of them is area of R, the other is minus area of R. Okay, so, one of them is strictly negative, the other is strictly positive. So, what does this mean? By the intermediate value property, there must be some value between A and B. There exists a value x naught between A and B such that f at x naught is 0. And observe that the value at x naught being 0 precisely means that, so let us draw the line through x naught. So, f of x naught is 0 just means that the area to the left of x naught is equal to the area to the, to the right of x naught. So, that is exactly how the function was defined. Okay? So, this is exactly the bisector that we are looking for, something which gives you uh, two pieces of equal area. Okay. So, there are many, many more such geometrical applications and uh, maybe I will indicate some of these in some of the future lectures. But for now, these already give us a good sense of how the intermediate value property can be used to prove uh, some rather interesting and maybe at first non-trivial facts about geometrical configurations and uh, transformations and so on. Okay. Okay.